Moving through the desert, I know it by the sound of my breath. Caustic air scours my lungs as I settle into a panting cadence opposite the rhythm of the rifle bouncing against my chest. My flak jacket doesn't quite fit. The straps float an inch off my shoulders, bringing thirty pounds of armor plate down hard against my spine each time a boot heel strikes hard-packed dirt. The Kevlar around my neck traps sweat and grime that froths into an abrasive paste. I feel patches of skin behind my ears start to rub away. The afternoon sun washes out my vision. Other senses compensate. Desiccated shrubs strewn with garbage bags and empty plastic bottles crunch under my boots. Farther up my body, the gear clipped to my webbing clatters like a tinker's cart. The tourniquet I always keep in easy reach of my left hand taps against my uniform blouse. Thirty-round magazines rattle in ammunition pouches around my waist, thirty-round capacity, but never loaded with more than twenty-eight, I know. Save the spring, prevent jams. It all moves with me in a way so familiar, so exact, that for a moment I think this could only be real. My eyes adjust and I see the convoy in front of me. Four Humvees and two seven-ton trucks. I understand suddenly and with queasy certainty why I'm running. I need to warn them about the pressure switch, hidden in a crack in the road. It's a length of surgical tubing stitched through with copper wire. The driver won't see it. They don't have a chance. The lead Humvee rolls over the crack. The front tire collapses the tubing. Wires touch. Voltage from a hidden battery reaches a length of detonation cord wrapped around artillery shells, buried with jugs of gasoline and soap chips. I wave my arms. A heartbeat before the whole nasty serpent shrieks to life and fill my lungs to cry out. And then, like always, I wake up. I kick the sheets from my small mattress and search across the dim corners of my studio apartment. Thin bands of morning sun seep through the window blinds. I'm still tired. I consider going back to sleep, but the nine empty beer bottles on the kitchenette counter promise me I'll only twist and groan, searching for a position that might ease my headache without putting additional pressure on my bladder. Better to get up and face it. It's a trade-off, drinking to fall asleep. I used to come out ahead in the bargain, but lately I've hit a point of diminishing returns. Three or four won't do the job anymore. Worse, I've taken to rich, hoppy craft brews that I suppose would make me feel better about the whole sad routine. No committed drunk would waste money on top-flight beer, right? I'm a young gentleman. A distinguished veteran entitled to some relaxation during this brief graduate school interlude, after which I'll emerge fully formed into the business world, armed with a new vocabulary by which to describe the more intense flavors of these nice, heavy ales. The hangovers are more intense, too. A price to pay for the sake of my self-respect, certainly. And with self-respect in mind, I decide to punish myself with a long run. The air carries an unfamiliar chill. It's the first morning of true winter in New Orleans. Dew clings to the cool grass of the St. Charles neutral ground. I weave to avoid the green streetcars. The damage bleeds away and pushing into a fourth mile. I feel good.